nice glass of wine when a neighbor he had not met walked up and introduced himself. They began talking, and soon the conversation turned to religion. The neighbor proudly informed our member that he belonged to such and such a church, a large local congregation that was well known for its vocal opposition to such things as smoking and dancing and drinking. The neighbor then asked our member if he belonged to a church. And our member replied that, well, yes. As a matter of fact, he belonged to a Lutheran church. And the neighbor, looking squarely at the glass of wine in our neighbor's hand, said, ah, yes, Lutheran, Lutheran. You're the ones who think you can do anything you want because you believe God was always forgiven, right? And our member didn't know what to say. And now today we gather here on this Reformation Sunday, this day in which we celebrate our heritage as a church of the Reformation. Our heritage is Lutheran. And is that what we celebrate today? That we get to do anything we want? Because God will always forgive us? That it really doesn't matter what we do? And actually, that's been the problem, the problem for the Reformation and Lutheranism from day one. When Martin Luther was strolling around Wittenberg or wherever, well, on second thought, it's hard to imagine Luther ever taking a leisurely walk, so intense he always was. So let's say that when Luther was striding, charging around Wittenberg or wherever, now and then he would come across fellow believers, believers who were carousing and carrying on, and he would demand to know what they thought they were doing. And they would answer, Brother Martin, you say that we are saved by faith, justified by grace. So, and that we already have God's forgiveness. So what we do doesn't make any difference. Needless to say, Luther would go ballistic and start haranguing them about honoring God, being thankful for God's grace, living lives worthy of the gospel. And they replied, ah, so what we do does matter then. Our works save us after all. And Luther would go ballistic again and scream that miserable sinners like them could never earn God's faith. And only by God's unmerited mercy and forgiveness could they hope to have salvation. Upon hearing that, the carousers figured they were well back to square one and they shrugged their shoulders and began carousing and carrying on as Luther stomped off, mumbling to himself. It's been the problem since day one. And it still is. Some years back, a member of the adult Sunday school class said that as a teenager growing up in a Lutheran church, the idea seemed to be that you could pretty much do anything you wanted during the week, as long as you showed up on Sunday for communion and got forgiven. Then on Monday, go right back at it. That's the problem. Does what we do matter or not? And deep down, we know that's a problem, a big problem. Everyone, every so often, you hear someone say about someone else, you know, he's such a fine, fine Christian man. You, however, happen to know that the man in question is a rather nasty piece of work. He may talk a good game tell you that he's in church Sunday after Sunday, go on and on about he's been saved, he impression with his knowledge of the Bible. And yet you know the man never lifts a finger to help others. Often voices cruel and prejudicial opinions and is self-centered and selfish, looking out only for himself. And so you wonder, what exactly does it mean to be a fine Christian man? And you can't help but believe that what we do and say and think matters greatly. That there's more to it than just getting saved and talking a good game. Deep down, we know what we do must matter somehow. But this is not simply the problem of the Reformation. 
The very problem of Scripture itself raises. But Scripture makes it absolutely clear is that God expected His people, Israel, to obey His law, do justice and righteousness, live as He called them to. And the Gospels make it clear that Jesus expected His disciples to obey His teaching, follow His way, live for love for God and the other. Jesus did not begin the Sermon on the Mount by saying, now folks, don't worry about what I'm about to say. I really don't expect you to do it. I'm simply going to present some nice ideals. That's all. You go on living just as you have been. Oh, I don't think so. Jesus demanded obedience to his heart in a costly way. And Paul's letters make it clear that he expected the believers to whom he was writing to obey, to live as new people, new creations in Christ. And there's something else, something many Christians would just as soon forget. And that is the last judgment. And there will be a last judgment. Scripture makes that clear. Jesus makes that clear. Paul makes that clear. Church doctrine makes that clear. And believe it or not, we make that clear every Sunday when we confess our faith and declare that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. And the other thing that's made clear is that we will be judged. Many Christians think that ah, the last judgment applies only to those out there who don't believe like we do. Uh, don't think so. Sorry, but we will all be judged. And what will we be judged on? Oh, what we've done or failed to do. And don't forget those thoughts and opinions and words. And simply saying, Lord, Lord. Simply saying we've been saved. Simply saying we believe. Won't cut it. That's the problem. What we do matters eternally. And we know it. But does that mean then that what we do does save us after all? So, we're back at the neighborhood party. Back to Luther hopping man on the streets of Whitmer. Back to making sure you show up for communion. So what's the answer? How do we resolve the problem? Well, actually, the answer can be stated with just one word. That's it. One word. Any idea what that word is? Any guesses? No, it's not justification, nor is it faith or grace. And it's certainly not casserole, as in potluck dinner. <laughs> Give up. It's this word, therefore. That's it. Therefore. And here's how it works. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, therefore, we have salvation. And what exactly did Jesus do? He offered the obedience God demanded of Israel, but that Israel could not give. And by offering that obedience, sacrificing himself out of love for his people, he gained the forgiveness of Israel, rescued them from their sin, opened them, a way for them to be God's people again. And by joining themselves to Jesus, following his way, they would have that salvation and be God's people. That's what salvation is all about, being part of God's people, being joined to Jesus and being part of his people. And thus salvation is really a gift that comes out of God's grace and mercy. And it was a gift that through Paul's ministry was available to all. Not simply Jew, but Gentile too. And it's the gift offered to us who, like Israel, can't give the obedience God requires, can't rescue ourselves. It's the gift we receive when we are joined to Jesus in baptism. But there's more. Because of God's faithfulness to us in Jesus, therefore, we can be confident on the day of judgment. 
in Jesus, what is seen is God's faithfulness to his purpose of redeeming, rescuing his creation from sin and death. And what is also seen is God's faithfulness to his promise that in his grace and mercy, his people will be part of the kingdom forever. To join ourselves to Jesus is not only to have the gift of salvation, but also to be put right with God, justified in his faith. Justification has to do with the last judgment and declares that we already know what the verdict will be. Guilty, but pardoned. Salvation proclaims that in Jesus we have been made part of God's people. Justification proclaims that at the last we shall be judged to be God's people and will be part of that kingdom. Not only are we set free from the past and the paralysis of guilt, we're also set free from the fear of judgment in the future and are able to live with confidence and hope in the present. And trusting what God has done, having faith in God's grace and mercy, that's what makes it operative in our lives. But, if you're still with me, we're not quite there yet. Because we still have the problem of what we continue to do. How we still act. What we think and say. Our sin. So there's one thing more. Because of the resurrection of Christ and the gift of the Spirit, therefore, we can be new people. We can actually obey. The resurrection proclaims that Jesus is truly God's Messiah. That he is the one who rescues and restores. That God has triumphed over sin and death. And he's inaugurated his kingdom. And to have faith is to be part of that kingdom. But even more, it says that God has given us his very power, the Spirit, to work in and through and on us, creating the faith and love and obedience, being kingdom people requires. To be open to the power of the Spirit is to be raised up day after day in forgiveness and given the will and strength to actually obey, to follow the way of Christ. So it says it all, therefore. But since it might sound a little complicated, let's go back to the neighborhood party, the streets of Whitburg, and communion. Now, do we as Lucians get to do anything we want? Sorry, but the answer is no. We are to obey. Do what God wants us to do. But does that mean our good works actually do save us then? No, because it's only when we have joined ourselves to Jesus and received the gift of salvation and justified by God's grace that in the power of the Spirit we actually can obey. Our faith identifies us as God's people. And our works, what we do, declares that we are who we say we are. That we want to be God's people. What we do keeps us recognizable to God. It's kind of like a kid who goes off and really misbehaves. And the parent is so frustrated just doesn't know what to do. And finally the parent says to the kid, I don't know who we are anymore. I know one thing, you're no child of mine. <laughs> Our works keep us recognizable to God as God's own child. And communion, well, we're going to continue to fail to fall short. Communion keeps us joined to Christ and God's forgiveness. Not so we can pick up where we left off, but so that we can be strengthened and nourished and start doing again what we should do, the power of the Spirit. So really, there's no problem. Just remember, therefore. So that the next time you're at a party, you can tell a neighbor what Lutherans believe and enjoy a nice sip of eh, whatever. Amen. Mm -hmm.